thank you. Okay, we, um, we are in 2 Timothy 4 this morning, and also in James 4 for a bit. This message for me is, uh, is pretty personal, so I share it with you um, out of a lot of experiences, especially a couple this week that have really stood out to me. So I, uh, I pray that God's word would, would touch us this morning. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, and then 19 through 21. Let's read God's word together. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. This sounds like our culture to me in many ways. So certainly Paul's words are fulfilled here. But you, he says, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry." I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. And then to verse 19 through 21. Greet Priscilla and Achilla in the household of Nisimus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. And then James 4, 13 through 14. He says these words, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. Okay, so first of all, God's not making small of our lives. They're very important. He's just making the point that they go quickly in the overall scheme of things. Um, This week, I've I've spoken with people in the church. Uh, There were two end-of-life scenarios where people passed away after strong, wonderful lives. And we had the stuff that happened in Paris last week. Um, And it brings us to this reality that we just never know how much time we have. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come, I ask that this word would trigger something in us. Lord, help us to understand how precious our time is. Help us, Lord, to see each divine opportunity and to make the most of it. As we come this morning, we ask that your word would trigger something in us to share with those that we love how we feel, to share the truth of who you are and and what life with you is like. God, give us big picture perspective. Help us to put each thing in its rightful place and to make choices that will enable us to look back and say, we did it right. Even when it was hard, we did it right. We're so grateful to you, Lord, this morning for this time in Jesus' name. 
Mm. There is a song. I don't know if some of you know this song. It's a country song. Some of you maybe aren't, aren't real country prone. But it's called uh, Live Like You Were Dying. We, we know this song a little bit. It's old Tim McGraw, right? Some of you are like, yeah. Some of you are like, who? It's okay. Um, he writes a song. The song is called Live Like You Were Dying. It talks about a man who finds out that he has cancer. That he might only have a limited amount of time left on this earth. And he says, so what'd you do when you find out? And the man says, hey, wow, how, Joel. I did not give him that picture. He just found it on his own. Joel's quite a guy. That's, that was, that's Tim McGraw. They're right. What? He has Tim McGraw all over his computer. Good, good to know. Good to know. But he asked him what he did when he found out that he, was, that he was sick with cancer. And he said, I went skydiving. I went rocky mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds, I mean riding on a bull. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I loved deeper. I loved deeper. I spoke sweeter. And I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. And he said someday, I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. And for a lot of us, when we realize that our time is limited, it changes how we approach life. You know, and I thought about those folks in Paris who were doing whatever they were doing, and the bomb goes off, and they're done. You know? People who have these car accidents, not knowing that was going to be the last time they got in the car. I mean, yes, yeah, some of us would get to have a full run till we're 90 or 100 or whatever, and that's great, but for others of us, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be gloomy, I'm not trying, oh, it's going to be gone tomorrow, no. But, but how do we look at our time? You know, I mean, do we take advantage of these opportunities? One, I went with one gentleman in our church, a wonderful guy who's been with us for a long time. His mom is in the nursing home, and she's at the end of her life, and she can't wake up anymore and talk. And, you know, he had had the joy of being able to tell her how much he loved her, that he appreciated, you know, her raising him in the church and knowing the Lord. And he was able to say those things, but some folks think it, and they say, you know, I'll, I'll say it someday, but they don't. And we see this, it's incredible scripture here. Paul at the end of his life talking to the person that he's closer to than anybody else and saying, these are the things that are important to me. I want you to know how I feel. You know, um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, um, I, was, I, was, uh, I had a very, very low self-esteem. Um, I was, you know, kind of made fun of in school. I was a very introverted kid. I was a guy who would be made fun of, and then like five minutes, they'd be like, oh, my comeback should be this. You ever have you been that guy before, right? So I'll come up and be like, oh, hey, stupid looking. I'd be like, and then I go home, and I'm like, oh, I should have said you're stupider looking. Oh, whatever, you know what I mean? Total bad example, but that's what it would be like. I was just, uh, during the class all the time. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go around people. I was, I was, I was very, very, very antisocial. God is crazy how he put me here after all this. Um, and I had a very, very low self-esteem. I really did not like myself. I didn't see any value in myself. Um, and I went, my aunt and my uncle are, are, are wonderfully godly people, and I went and spent the summer with, a month in the summer with them. And one night, um, my uncle came into my room and said, Zach, I know you've been raised in the church, but do you know Jesus? You know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you mean. I mean, I, you know, yeah, we sing the songs, and I've read the stories. You know, and he says, well, that's not all there is to it. That Jesus is a real person who you can know and walk with and, and who can change your life and give you a sense of, of worth and of self and of life that you cannot have without him. He didn't use those words. I was like 12. But... That was the gist. And he led me in receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior, and my whole life changed. When I began to realize that somebody loved me, 
who created me. Somebody almighty thought that I was special, that I was important, that I had value to him. Changed how I saw myself and changed how I related to others in life. And my uncle is a great man of God, and, and he shared the gospel with every one of my mom's sisters and brothers. There's five of them and their kids. And a lot of them said, get out of here. I don't like you. Get lost. But some came to know Jesus. You know, and those conversations are hard. I mean, they can be, right? Say, Brian doesn't know, know love the Lord, right? I, go over and say, I say, hey, Brian. He's like, hey, what's going on? I said, hey, you know, we're talking about stuff. Oh, you know what? I, I just, I don't know if, you know if you know Jesus or, you know, but he's done some stuff in my life, you know. Brian can say, dude, what's wrong with you? Or stop, or get out, or what? Right? He can do that. Brian, this Brian would never do that. But another guy might. You know? And so, yeah, I risk being hurt in that process. But I think about what my uncle did for me. It radically changed my life. I mean, to the point where I committed my life to do this with all of you. You know, because he said, look, you need to know the most important thing any person can know. And again, it's just a starting point. We go from there into all the great things of the Spirit and life with God, and our lives are radically amazing because of Jesus. But it starts with sharing with someone the greatest secret anyone can have. And it shouldn't be a secret. At this point in Paul's life, if you remember at the end of the book of Acts, Paul is left in house arrest. Remember the book of Acts? So he goes and he gives his testimony and he's waiting to give more testimony in Rome and Paul, uh, and, and the author Luke is writing about Paul and he's in house arrest. He's in, he's in an apartment in Rome. He's got friends coming and going. He's got the Roman guard there but really everyone's friendly and he's doing great ministry and we know from the history here that Paul was released in 62 or 63 and he goes on a fourth missionary journey to Miletus, about 200 miles from Athens. Great success. Starts another church over there. And then in 66, Paul is arrested again, this time by Nero. Do we know Nero historically? So Nero was like the most vicious anti-Christian emperor ever. At one point, he even burns some of Rome and blames the Christians for it. He says, the Christians burned us. Let's, let's kill them all, right? And he arrests Paul, and he puts him in prison. But this time, he doesn't put him in house arrest. He puts him in an actual jail with bars and jailers and criminals. And this is where he writes 2 Timothy from. It's about 66 AD. He dies in 67. Nero cannot um, crucify him, but he beheads him. And so Paul writes this letter with this reality very much in front of him. He knows what Nero wants to do. He knows why he's in jail. It's very different from the end of Acts. And he says to Timothy, he says, do your best in verse 9 to come to me quickly. Paul is closer to Timothy than anybody else in 1 Timothy 1-2. He says that, that Timothy is his true son in the faith. In Philippians 2.20, he says that he has nobody else like Timothy. But here he is, he's sharing this end of life time and he's saying, I want you to come. I want to see you. I want to tell you how I feel. I want to share my appreciation. I don't want you to not know. And, and for some reason, for so many of us, especially guys, I don't know why, sorry guys, it's kind of how it is, we just assume things are understood. But I think some of the time, we've got to actually say the things that we feel in our hearts. I love you. You're important to me. I forgive you for the things you did that I was mad about. That's a big deal. How do we feel about somebody? Who's that person that we're like, oh man, I know they would, we could have a good conversation about it. Who can I share the truth of Jesus with? Who can I pray for? 
Because we have these people that we hold on to. You know, for me, it was my dad. I, and, I, and I... You know, and I worked up the courage to go down and talk to him. And my dad's an amazing man. I love him so much. And I definitely, you know, want to do well by him. And I want to honor him. And I don't want to make it weird. And so I went down, you know, and, and even though I was raised in the church, my, my parents both were pretty nominal. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was this awkward situation where we sat down and I said, Dad, I just want to talk to you about some things that are important to me. But we had this conversation about Jesus and who he was and what his role was in life. And I'll tell you, it was one of the hardest conversations that I had, but I know forever going forward that I have the peace that we had to talk. You know what I mean? That we had the conversation. You know, and, and for a lot of us, you know, we can put it off. And put it off. And put it off some more. Oh, you know, I'll do it someday. Or just when the time is right. Or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, that time goes by. You know, I, I was a chaplain in Arcadia Methodist Hospital for, um, for a while. And we all rotated on shifts at night. So we'd go on 24-hour shifts. If someone would come into the ER and pass away, they would call a chaplain and to sit with the family because the medical staff had to go do medical things. And they couldn't sit with the family and talk to the family when they were grieving. So I got a call one night, and I came in, and there was a Korean man in his mid-50s. He had gone to the local casino, and he felt some uh, lower back pain, which for a lot of guys is the beginning of a heart attack. No, upper back pain, the beginning of a heart attack. He had upper back pain, he went home, he went to bed, and he had a heart attack and died. And he came in to the, to the ER. They had, they, by the time they got him in, he was already passed away. And so they put him in one of the, we have these side rooms where the, they'd put the deceased folks and then the family would be led in to see the body there. And my job would be to sit with the, the family and meet them as they came in and explain, oh, I'm so sorry, this is what's happened, and you know, give them time to grieve. And I remember I, I was in this room, and, and the relatives were starting to come in, and there was, there was one believing sister who made sure to tell me that everyone else didn't really know God, and so it might be kind of, kind of hard. I remember this so well. This, uh, th there was a daughter, she was 18, 19 years old, of the, of the man who passed away, and she ran in to the, to the room, and she pounded on the chest of this guy. I mean, hard. But you could hear the thumps all around the room. She said, no, you can't go yet. There are things I have to say. And is, is that us? I ask myself that question. Is that me? You know, do they know? Have I loved well? Have I been clear? Even if I've been told to go away or I'm rejected, have I loved well? Have I made the most of every opportunity? I thank my Uncle Paul all the time for, that he cared enough to talk to me about Jesus. Is there someone for us? You know, Paul writes here in verse 11, he says, get Mark and bring him with you. He is helpful for me in my ministry. Do you guys remember John Mark? We talked about Barnabas uh, a month or two ago. Remember, Mark, John Mark, was the cousin of Barnabas. And when Barnabas and Paul first set out on their first missionary journey, uh, Mark, as they were going along, got scared and ran away. People were mean in ministry to him. I've heard this happens. Not here, though, but other places. And, and he encountered mean people, and it freaked out, and he ran away. And Paul called him a quitter. And when they went back to go on their second missionary journey, Barnabas said, hey, I've talked with Mark. Let's bring him. It's going to be great. Mark is wonderful. And Paul said, no shot. I don't want the quitter. No quitters. Paul ran a tight ship. No quitters. And Barnabas and Paul, and, and, and Paul fought so much that Barnabas took Mark and went on one missionary journey, 
and Paul took Silas and went on another one. And we find out, because Luke goes with Paul, we find out that as time goes by, the Mark rededicated his life, rededicated himself in the faith, became a great champion of the gospel around the Roman world to the point that where when Peter goes to Rome to give his testimony, Mark goes with him and writes down the entire testimony and begins to circulate it around the churches, and it becomes the book of Mark, the first written gospel. And so here's, here is Paul saying at the end of my life, I want to see Mark. He told Mark, I, basically, I hate you. I don't ever want to see you again. And now he's saying, look, I see what you've done. I know who you are. I want to see you. I want to tell you some things. I want to share with you how I feel. And he's calling for Mark. You know, everything that we have is a gift. Our time, our abilities, our insights, our possessions, all of it's a gift. And I feel like, you know, we come to the end of life, we go before the Lord, and the, and the question really is, how did you do with it? How did you do with my son? What kind of stewards were we? And all of us have different things to work with. But how did we steward what we were given? How did we use it? You know, I, I love, I love to help people grow in the spirit and, and, and walk and and discern the voice of God as they, as they grow in prophecy. It's one of my favorite things to do. You know, it's something that God has, has brought into my life, and, and the, the best thing I can do is to help others find this and realize this and walk in this. I want to steward it well. And the question is, how have we stewarded what we've been given? This is not a downer, but it's an upper. Some of you are like, oh, gosh. And, and, or, or if we have conviction, where do we make those adjustments? I mean, most of us here have plenty of time. But, but there are areas, there are things that we can do, that we can say. Opportunities that we can, that we can take to make a difference. We do with our time, our, our, our possessions. Our relationships. You know, people sometimes say to me, okay, so why did you go into pastoral ministry? They say, why did you want to be a pastor? A lot of really good reasons, you know. The high salary and the huge pension plan. That is a joke, by the way, for those of you that are, that are. You know, or maybe it's the committee meetings where we talk about, you know, building problems or, you know, painting the building or fixing the carpet or whatever. And all that stuff's very important but it's not why I came into ministry. Why I get up, why I do it, it's always, always, always been about changed lives. It's always been about changed lives. Where someone hears something or sees something and a light goes on and something connects and people recognize and, 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 and realize the truth of Jesus. Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit. The reality of relationship with God. It's changed lives that matters the most. So as, as we close, my question for you is, who needs to hear from you and what do they need to hear? Even if you think they know, if you haven't said it, I would encourage you to say it anyway. We could never, never hear it enough when it comes to things like love, value, honor, and the truth of Christ. The reality of who God is. Let's, let's close together. Lord God, I pray that we would all carry testimony of your great faithfulness. We would all carry testimony of saying, this is what has come from my life. This is the good fruit. This is where God has been glorified. This is where Jesus has been, has been magnified and known and, and even come into the lives of those that I care about. 
Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.